Uh, today, we are going to use the Arbenz book to warm up. So I haven't played really any notes today except to do a little quick sound check. Uh, if you're if you're noticing that I'm uh, starting this a little bit late, I'm sorry about that. I had some Twitch problems, and so if you're seeing this on Twitch, uh, well, I guess I'll have to say this later because you'll have to have a chance to catch up. But if you're seeing this on Twitch, I would love to know if you are seeing it at all. Uh, so, so uh, I have the restream uh, chat up, and uh, I don't, I don't know if it's connecting to you or not. Uh, it just gave me some errors when I was trying to update the title. So. Um, Hopefully it'll be fixed by next week. But anyway, we're going to use the Arbenz book, and everything you need basically is in the Arbenz book. Uh, I mean, that's obviously not true because we have a thousand other books, but how do you use the Arbenz book if it's all you have, or uh, what, what validity would that statement have if we were to test it out, right? So, well, the first thing is it has lots of words that most people don't read, and so... Um, I'm not going to read to you necessarily too much, but I do want to sort of look at the... We're going to start with first studies, because they're the first studies, and they're really good for long tones, which is a really good way to start on the trumpet every day. Um, and so we need to read how to do that, right? So he says, uh, commence or strike the sound by pr pronouncing the syllable tu, right? Tu. Uh, sustain it well, and at the same time, impart to it all possible strength and brilliancy. Under no circumstances should the cheeks ever be puffed out. Uh, you shouldn't make noise. Uh, the lips should make no noise in the mouthpiece, uh, though many performers appear to think otherwise. So that's a very interesting thing to say, right? Uh, the sound forms itself. It should be well struck by proper tension of the lips so that it may be properly in tune. Uh, okay, so I sort of understand that, right? And not below uh, its diapason, for in the latter case is a disagreeable and untuneful sound would be the result. So um, I wish uh, I knew how to pronounce that word. I might have said it incorrectly, but anyway. Um, and then he talks about some of the specifics there uh, and why, you know, you should basically that you should do lip slurs and not do the proper fingerings or you should follow the fingerings that are on the page. So uh, then, and he goes on to tell you more stuff about how to do the different kinds of exercises. And there's a lot more before that, but I just thought that would be, we should maybe think about those things, right? Making sure that we support, uh, that we have the proper lip tension, and what does that mean exactly? And, um, I, and then it has some just really good beginner stuff, like don't puff your cheeks out, right? Uh, and I know a lot of uh, band directors, I, I have a list of stuff that bothers me when I go to band programs, and one of the big things is that there's a kid puffing their cheeks out playing, and it doesn't seem like anybody's doing anything to correct it. Uh, and so if they read their Arben's book, then uh, they would know that that's not a good way to do it, uh, both the student and the teacher. Uh, okay, so let's do some first studies. We don't have to start at the very beginning if we don't want to, but it is a good place to start. Um, yeah, let's, let, let us start there. And there's some interesting things about it that I think, I'm not going to, this could be like an eight-hour warm-up if I talk about every single thing, right? So I'm not going to do that. But some interesting things about it, uh, if you look down the page, for the first, you know, the, the, the first one, he, you repeat every note. Well, okay, well, when we try this, let's figure out why we might want to do that, right? Uh, number two, same thing, you do every note twice. And then number three, you go away from a note and come back, All right? Uh, number four, the same thing. Number five, you go further away, right? So he's building something here that, uh, and, and you know, it's also very long notes. So we have a lot of time to do what he asked us to do in the first studies, right? Strike with the tongue, and T U is written over each one. Uh, the the most recent sort of pedagogical philosophy on this is that you you should say this in uh, old French, in, in 1800s French, right? That it's not ta, it's ti, right? And that keeps your tongue very high in the middle and in the front, and I think that's good, um, but I wouldn't get too caught up on it, right? If you say ta, well, it's not going to work as well as tu or ti, Right, because there's a lot of motion to that, but you'll hear that in the sound, and so then you'll you'll you should be able to correct. And that's the other part that I want to talk about before we get started here, and that is that something that everyone knew, everyone ha didn't have to be told in 
Arben's time is that you have to play everything musically, right? You would never play anything just to play notes. You can't play notes. You play music. It's a musical instrument, and so everything we do on it is, uh, should be musical, right? Now, it's, we talk about the difference between the musical instrument up here and the mechanical instrument that is the trumpet here, right? That's a different, that's a different kind of way to, 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 to splice things, right? To, to separate them into physical things and uh, musical mental things, right? But when we're playing the trumpet, uh, we really almost always want to be musical uh, because that's going to inform how we, how we do it, right? So if I, if I just go for the music, and sometimes the music is a really simple thing, like can I sustain this note until the breath mark? That's all we're doing here. Um, now, we can also use the Arvin's book not exactly the way that he prescribes. Uh, for instance, if I want to do some mouthpiece buzzing up front, well, then I can use the Arvin's book this way, right? So let's, let's do that. And you can skip this part if you don't want to do any mouthpiece buzzing or cutout buzzing. I'm going to do cutout buzzing. So let's get my cutout if I can find it. Aha! Here it is. All right? And for me, I'm just going to get the first note. We're also going to do this all on my French Besson because it's a little more contemporaneous, but also because uh, I'm, I, want to, I want to calibrate my trumpet playing the best I can. And so I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to play the, the instrument that forces me to play the most efficiently with, with the most sort of, um, well, efficiency. I won't belabor that point, right? This is the instrument that really trains me to do it, and I've talked about that in a lot of videos. Uh, and then when I play my bigger trumpet, uh, I have to sort of, I have to play a little differently, right? But um, it's, it's actually, it's harder to play uh, after I've played this a lot. This is really efficient. Now, I can't get the same sound on this, but anyway. So we're, we're going to play this just because it's fun to play. I'll be a little more out of tune, which will force me to use my ears a little bit better. And, uh, but it's contemporaneous, uh, not to the book that's about 40 years younger than the, than the Arben's book is, but it's contemporaneous with my version of the Arben's book, which is a good sort of turn of the century. I've shown this before, but this library bound, uh, leather bound, I should say, edition. Right? Uh, I don't know if there's a date in this, but it might be interesting to find out. Um, usually, there is. It's the this is the this is the public domain one. So if you go, <clears throat> if you go on, there it is. Right? That looks familiar. If you're if you're getting the the free version off of IMSLP, um, but I don't see I don't see a copyright date, which I guess makes sense because it's probably pre copyright. Um, but anyway, it's about turn of the century, so uh, we're going to play out of this today. And it doesn't have as many markings. We can also sometimes do a comparison of editions if we want to, to see, um, you know, if something's different in the Carl uh, in the in the more modern versions, uh, because each editor makes little sort of notes to tell you what to do, and uh, and they update the tempos as well, right? So the further back you go, the less information is on the page, and sometimes that's a good thing. It allows for more interpretation to use the way you want. So, all right, uh, I need a first note, so that's what we're gonna get here, and then I still have lost it. Okay, there we go. So our first note is gonna be, okay. So I'm gonna go through a couple of these exercises on the cutout first, because that's what I need. Right, and this is how I'm using the book. And then we'll go back and do it on the trumpet. And if you don't want to do cutout or don't have a cutout, you could just skip this part, or you can just sort of wade through it with me and see how things go. So here we go. Ta -da.
right, so let's see if we got close. Oh, uh, I, I knew I'd be off by a half step. I always go sharp when I do cut out. That's okay, though. So I, that was just the first, first study. Uh, now let's see if we can do a different one uh, further down the line. If that's even going to be helpful. Mm. No, I don't think necessarily it will be. I mean, we don't have to go too far. We can do... We can do some, uh, so I just did poo attacks on that one, and I, at, by the end, I started to figure out that I wanted a taper, because uh, it says to do that. It has, it looks like an accent, and I guess it could be, you know, but what's the difference between an accent and a taper, right? It, it's just the speed of it, and over a, a whole note, uh, I would argue that, I, I think he's just trying to get us to attack the note, like he says, two, two, right, t, 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 it's really what I'm doing, but, uh, but I, I also like the idea that the taper uh, trains our soft playing too, and that's what I'm working on. So let's get the, our pitch again, and we'll just do everybody's favorite intervals. Um, I don't, I don't like when when people say I warmed up and then they go. That's I always I, I always sort of I don't I I, I try not to roll my eyes at anything because that's a valid exercise, but. Um, Sometimes they'll, that's their whole warm up. And so, uh, and it's a sure sign that uh, their, their, what their idea of a warm up is, is what they did in band. And that is not usually a good warm up for all the instruments. It's a good warm up for the band, right? And I say this over and over again on uh, multiple videos that if you're playing, uh, if you want to play your instrument at a college or higher level, you need to be doing individual warm ups on your own instrument that are not prescribed for the entire band, right? That's to try to get all of you playing together and also not injure yourself. And so there are some good things. There are some lip slurs for, for brass, right? And there are some, you know, fingering things for woodwinds and they, they're sometimes combined in a good way, but um, it's nowhere near enough. They'd have to spend the entire band period warming up the band and, and uh, doing things for everyone. And because an hour, hour long routine is really not that much. So, uh, so you should be doing this on your own before you get to band. And I know that's not something that everybody can do, um, but the trumpet doesn't care if, you, if your situation allows for it. You have to find that time. And, um, and it can be after school too. It doesn't have to be before band. It's best if it can be before you go to a rehearsal. Uh, but if you, if you can do it later in the day, that's fine too, as long as you do it. So anyway, uh, but this, the, it, there is a reason to do these, right? Okay. hard to do without losing that buzziness. And you, you saw I had to adjust there. I, I moved my pinky and then I couldn't get the pressure even again. So I had to readjust. <clears throat> and I guess I could be doing this in the horn, but, uh, and that's different. It, it feels different to do that. Uh, we don't want to do too much crazy range with the cutout necessarily. Uh, you can do though. Uh, we'll do one, I guess. Let's, let's do one and I'll put it in the horn so that I can use pressure. Haha. <laughs> put it in this horn. Let's see. We'll do everybody's favorite here. I uh, hopefully I'll stay on. This is number eleven. Boy, boy.
you can hear I have a lot of pitch skew problems in, in my holding, but uh, a lot of that is going to be cleared up by the reflection of the entire trumpet, right, the back pressure. And, uh, and this is helping me just get the coordination of it. So if you're wondering about the cutout stuff, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is just be a little bit more deliberate about placing things and getting a really good uh, vibrating uh, uh, aperture so that it's not spread out or, or too tight or anything like that. All right, that's enough of that and enough of this trumpet. Now, we're going to go back and do all the same stuff on the B-flat trumpet on the French bass in here. Let's see if I... I got a little sharp, but not too bad. <clears throat> all right, so... Oh, we've got some spam in the chat. Thank you. Block them forever. There. Okay. So now we're just we're using this as a warm up, right? But we're gonna get everything we want to get done today done. And so uh, I've I've only been streaming for about 17 minutes, um, and I talked for about a lot of that, right? Uh, so now it's gonna go pretty fast, and we're gonna still want to rest enough. But you'll have to determine how much rest you need on your own. Uh, I I usually need a lot more rest than I than I used to. And uh, I probably should have been taking more rest overall. So it's nice to think about this in, I, get, I do an exercise and then I rest that amount and then I do the next exercise and I rest that amount. But for these first studies, I'm gonna do them all together and then we'll talk about some things as I rest and then we'll go forward. So I'm also playing my uh, uh, Bach uh, straight seven that I like that kind of goes with this horn also from about the same era. It's a little bit later, about maybe 20 years later than the instrument itself. But still pretty, like early, early 1940s or 30s. Uh, 30s probably for this one. I didn't do that, but I'm also going to use my, my tuner uh, because I want to know if I'm in tune at all. And this horn, this horn is not really in tune with itself as much as my modern instruments. So um, this is a good time to use the tuner, right? To see if you change pitch as you're tapering. And these aren't super long tones, but you could do them slower if you really wanted long, long tones. Uh, but I think these will be enough for me today. So you can sort of hear I have some pitch skew issues in my playing too, and they, they tend to not be as pitchy as color skew, and that's uh, something that we want to control. But if you combine this with some of the other things that I talk about in warm-ups, right, like forward sound, for instance, right, if you're leaning against this reflection that I talk about all the time, well, 
then you're going to get some stability out of that. And so while we're not doing anything explicitly to find that, because that's not really uh, in the in the Arbenz book in any way, right? We could we could add those other things that we the, the sort of what I call proto trumpet playing, right? Lead pipe buzzing, um, vented valve lead pipe buzzing, stuff like that. We can add that before we start playing the whole horn, before we get to the Arbenz book, and then still use the Arbenz book for the rest of it. All right. So I'll keep this up, uh, and hopefully it'll be in my field of view uh, while we go on. Let's do number ten now. Same things we did on the cutout, right? We could do other things as well, but, uh, and you can look through this section, right? If you're playing along at home, uh, there's so much to it. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the overwhelming parts about the Arbenz book is it's, it's a lot. And so, like, do you do everything? Well, not every day, I hope, right? But which ones do you do? And I would, I would suggest that uh, you could do different ones that look the same every day. So, in other words, I don't need to do seven because I did number one. But... If I'm tired of number one, maybe I do go, you know, and, and it, it expands. So maybe you work through it sort of in a forward fashion. You can sort of figure out uh, the best way to do it for yourself, right? Uh, I really like number seven, actually. Uh, we're not going to do it, but it, it basically does everything just up a fifth, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so you just do it. Oh, it's, I guess it's only the last one. But yeah, the last one is really, it's kind of important. It's like... Yeah, these are the same, actually, right? And he doesn't say anything. There's, this is another book without a lot of words in line, right? There's a lot of words before each chapter, but not during it. And um, so you have to kind of interpret, like, well, what is he trying to get me to do here? But if you're not sure, just try to do it, and your success will prove that whatever it is, you are already doing it, or your failure will prove that you need to find it, right? And that's a good way to do things. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm still not getting this the way I want it, so... I guess I need to do, or go backwards in the Arbenz book, right? Don't, you don't need to go, uh, you don't need to keep banging your head against the uh, same, the same number eight or whatever, right? Go back to number seven, go back to number six, go back to number one if you need to. Either in that section or go back a section because they sort of work, they, they're, they're disparate, well you'll see in, in a little while, but they, they, they don't have to be played in order, but uh, that is one way that it can work. All right, that's enough rest. Here we go. We didn't do any more of that on the cutout. There's more to number 10, but we're going to stick with that. All right, we stay on that page. We looked at other things, but... All right, here's number 11 now. And you really should do all of some of these things, but I wanted to just mirror the cutout. Uh, if you're going to do extra stuff like cutout uh, uh, mouthpiece, or maybe you have a buzz aid like the, the up sound, you know, or something like that, um, don't overdo it then, right? Maybe do little pieces of things multiple times and try to connect that together. But uh, if you just have the trumpet, you can do the whole thing. And, and you can also go faster and slower, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's built for you to see it, but it's also not telling you exactly how to do it so you can do it the way you need to do it. Oh, and I'm sorry I didn't mute my mic, but all right. Here we go now on number 11.
So there's a good opportunity for us to be musical instead of worrying about the technique that we're using, right? I wanted it to, I wanted those, those short accented notes to, or yeah, they're a little sort of uh, 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 rooftop looking, it, it means very short, right? Um, I wanted those to be nice and light and open and I wanted them to be clear attacks. And then the other ones I wanted to be sort of accented and decaying, right? And, uh, and I was sort of keeping my eye, out of the corner of my eye on my intonation to make sure that it was kind of at least roughly in the center. And even when I didn't like the intonation, I just kind of looked down and go, oh, well, I guess it's still pretty close. And maybe that's as close as I can get this horn today, right? That's okay. I'm not, I, I can work on it if I want, just abstractly, right? That's my main problem is that my F on this horn is so stupid sharp. Uh, and it's, it's like that, the, the G, G, F, E kind of range and the C, B flat, A kind of range are, are crushed. So that the G's are really sharp and the C's are really flat. You can see that here. It's just, a, and that's, that's why I wanted to play this horn, because these are the problems of, uh, of the day, right? When Arben was alive and when uh, people were using this book at Paris Conservatory, I mean, we're still using it, but when he was still alive, the instruments were not better than this. And so they had to do all, they had to think about all this stuff, um, but they did it musically. And that's where, I'm, that's where I'm trying to get you to go. All right, so there's uh, some first studies. Now we can do, I, I sort of got ahead of myself and already started playing scales. So... Let's say I want to work on my intonation, right? Okay. Well, let, just in st still in first studies, uh, I'm going to go with, uh, how about, how about number 18? I've got a high G in there. Starts on G. It's exactly where we're talking about. I could also do number 17 instead if I was thinking more like, well, yeah, but my low C is bad. I mean, let's do that. Let's just go ahead. We'll do number 17. And if you look at number 16, it's all these, these rooftop types, uh, short accents. Um, there's actually two different types of accent in number 15, uh, but I think he's trying to get us to do basically the same thing, just the, the, the open V instead of the, the, the small closed V uh, indicates that it's supposed to be hit a little harder, right? Uh, as opposed to just being uh, uh, short. But uh, I think it's, you know, kind of, in other words, this is a big version of the little notes, right? So, so we do a little more of the thing. Um, anyway, we only have quarter notes through these, so we're going to just do, uh, we, I mean, he also doesn't give us markings after number 16, so are we to assume that we do the same markings? Maybe so, but I can, I can do, he leaves that interpretive room, right? I, if I want to play legato, because I think that's going to help me hear my intonation better, um, there's nothing stopping me, so I am going to do that.
adds a lot of work on this, especially on this this sharp uh, rimmed mouthpiece. But you can hear like I'm not I'm not doing so great on this, and if I'm not doing great on this, what's my intonation going to be like when I'm playing the Tomasi or the Hindemith or something, right? There's no there's no chance. And I made a big mistake uh, in that I I played it slowly enough that I could listen for my intonation but I made it about the intonation instead of about the musical line. So we could try, uh, we'll try a different one and I'll play more musically and see if that helps. I mean, certainly it'll be a little faster um, just so that I physically can get through it. But, um, but that's actually not bad. It's like a, a little over a minute probably of playing. And uh, if I can't do that, then, you know, maybe I, <laughs> maybe I have bigger problems, right? So uh, now I, I'm trying to wrangle every note and I'm going really slow for it. So it makes sense that uh, that would be tiring, but uh, I need to do things like that because that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to be up against when I play real pieces in ensembles, uh, solos, whatever it is, right? Etudes for sure. Uh, and they're going to be a lot more complicated than that. So that's kind of why we, uh, we, we're using this part of the book, right? Okay, let me do number, um, oh gosh, 19 looks good, right? Uh, it's got some long notes in it, and it's got some sharps and things. Well, two sharps. So, uh, yeah, that might be a good one for me to do. And somebody's actually marked in this version to crescendo towards the top of the line, and guess what? That's one way of being musical. I'm not going to necessarily crescendo, but I do want, in terms of uh, uh, color, I do want that that arrival to be just like what somebody wrote in here. But I'm, I'm phrasing as I do these, and I can still check my intonation kind of on the, on the fly. So here's number 19. So we went faster, which made the music making a little bit easier, right? But, um, and our intonation was better. Uh, we also didn't have nearly as many E in the staffs, which are the really bad note on this horn. There's no way to pull the first valve. But if you're, if you're playing a modern instrument today and you're wondering, yeah, why, is, why are those notes so, so sharp? Well, they're sharp on your instrument too. And that's why you have a little thumb saddle, right? That's why you have this guy right here because any combination valve note is gonna be sharp. So that's A, you pull out a little for A. That's E, you pull out about the same amount for E, right? That's D, we know that we have to pull out for that. Uh, it's actually, technically, it's E flat as well, but they already make this too long, so you don't have to worry about that. So, you know, that's why A like this is flat, because it's really, a, it's in tune for A flat. And that makes it a little easier to play D in tune. You don't have to pull out as far, and it's the same thing for C sharp, right? That's the most combination valve note. And so, but yeah, but the E on this horn and the A uh, are really bad. And the A is mitigated a little bit because it's getting into a flatter register on this particular instrument, but the E is really, really bad. And so I have to, oh, I have to sort of hold it down, or I can pull this, but now I'm. I'm sacrificing my intonation on, let's say, B-flat in the staff, right? So I'll pull it a little more, see if I can get it. You have to sort of work this out on these old horns, and then, and then you just leave it, right? I'm also all the way out on my third valve, so I can't even pull out for Ds and C-sharps, 
very much. I got about that much room from A, this is A flat, and then D is here, and then C sharp is really further than I can go, so I have to lip that one too. All right, so that's been a little bit of uh, first studies here, and we can keep going, right? If you're, like I said, a good method here is to, like, let's say today you do, out of the first section, you do, let's say you're on number three, okay? Let's say you always do maybe one, just to get warmed up a little bit. And then you do two the next day, and then you do one and three the next day, and then you do one and four the next day, right? And you just kind of keep working your way through it. Um, and then eventually you say, I don't want to do one anymore. I'm going to start with seven now. I'm going to do seven and eight, and then seven and nine, right? And then maybe you say, oh, nine is kind of like 10, so I'll do seven and either nine or 10, and then I'll move on to 11 one day, and then the next day 12, but I'm still doing one of like, seven, 10, and 13. See what I mean? So that you're doing like one of each type and moving, moving through pretty quick, right? And then these get into sort of scale patterns. And so, you know, maybe I do uh, 17 one day and then 18 the next day and, and skip 17, right? And then I've got scales in thirds, so I can sort of work through so that you're only doing one of each type each day, and then you're moving on to the next one, unless that one was really hard for you, in which case you're going to do it again the next day, right? And so you can sort of just look through and see things are pretty similar all the way through uh, until you get to the syncopated rhythms. Where is that? Oh, studies on syncopation, number, uh, page 23. And I, when I say page numbers now, it's always going to be the old Arbenz book. If you have the new uh, Tom Hooten and Jen Murata edition of the Arbenz book, it has different page numbers, which drives me crazy. But uh, you can find the sections, and those will still those will be in the beginning of the book, so you can just go look there. Uh, but, so this is studies on syncopation, and again, why why is this here? Well, because reading rhythm is an essential part of music making, right? And this is supposed to help you play the trumpet, which is a musical instrument that you're going to play musically, right? So we can do some of these. Uh, I'm going to skip number one for now because my rhythm is pretty good, I hope. But, uh, but you, you, you could, these, these you can usefully do like sort of in a row, right? So just one a day uh, and just kind of until, until one of them is difficult for you and then, and then maybe stay on that one for a couple of days. But I'm going to do number uh, three, I guess. You can also use a metronome very, very usefully almost all the way throughout the book. I can go a little faster than that. I'll go up to 110. So you can see uh, it's not a terribly difficult exercise and they get more complicated. I, I can do one more just to give you an example. Um, we'll go a couple of pages. When you get to studies on dotted eighth uh, uh, followed by sixteenths, these get a little bit, oh, this page might not stay for me, sorry about this. Uh, this, this book was repaired with some tape. And so the first pages, uh, like they're trying to pull themselves back into book form instead of open book. So uh, I should use my other one really, but here we go. This is number 13. And these are still part of the same kind of set of studies. So you can hear, we're already playing musically, we're already dealing with time, we're already dealing with 
direction. We're already having to think about where we're going to breathe and where best is to breathe. So, and that's, this is not a hard etude, right? This is, I mean, it's not, I don't even know if you'd call it an etude. I, I guess it says studies and studies are etudes, but they're so short, right? But if, you, if this is a thing that you struggle with, if it's rhythm, if it's uh, the, the tonguing of it, right? Um, and you can go fast, you can go slow. Again, it doesn't say a tempo in this edition. The next, the, the, the future editions, um, particularly the one that everybody tends to have, the big red one, right? Uh, I don't have it here. I have the Schilke one I can show you, which is right here. It's missing a lot of pages, but I still have, I've retained, I've retained the, uh, the cover because it's really neat. So this is an old Schilke edition. Uh, put that in focus. And it's in six languages. So uh, English, French, German, Japanese, Spanish, and Russian. So, uh, and it's at the, at the top of every, every section. Uh, it tells you in, in those six languages what it is. So um, I could use this, but it's missing. The reason I didn't start with it is uh, it's missing like the back you know, I don't know how many pages off the back. This binding is not very good with this type of paper. So anyway, that's just an interesting little version of it. And I have the three volume Arbens there as well, but that's not today's uh, thing, right? So, all right. Now we've already gotten into some tonguing and uh, we started with tonguing, if you remember, right? So uh, we, we can usefully sort of go through these sections um, Eventually, we want to get to multiple tonguing, but we're not we're not quite even to lip slurs yet. So, uh, I would skip over. I would do again this section on the dotted eighth sixteenth, uh, or just really syncopation altogether, right? If you keep going and keep going, uh, you just get more different kinds of this. You end up in triplet land or six eight land, right? Uh, and so, one of these every day that you really perfect is good because there's only oh gosh uh, thirty seven of them, right? So that's a month, and then you go back to the beginning, or maybe you stick with the ones that are, some of these are really hard, uh, just to tongue, or, I mean, it's, there's some hard stuff in here that you may never perfect, right? But most of it is, is imminently doable uh, over time. Okay, so now we've got the slurs, right? This is where it gets really good. So um, I'm not going to read to you this, this stuff, but I really recommend that you do read it. Uh, you don't have to believe what he says, but you do, sh you, you do need to know how he thinks it should be done so that you have at least a starting point, right? And if you, if you say that's not how it works for me, that's fine, right? But read what he says because, um, it, well, it's just really interesting. I'm trying not to read it right now, you know. Um, I think a, a basic way to say it is um, just make sure that you do it the right way. And he thinks that that's one way, and uh, I'm, I'm, I may or may not dis disagree with him. I mean, uh, but it starts with the slur as in, as in a valve slur, right? He doesn't say that it's lip slurs right away. So again, the slur or legato, and this is another important point that we missed today. Legato does not mean... Uh, it's not a, a form of tonguing necessarily. It means bound together. That's the Italian translation of legato is bound together. And in other words, as close as two things can be and bound that way so they can never separate, right? That's what legato means. And a slur marking, it, we, we can slur, but like a violin, they don't have slurs. A uh, piano, they don't have slurs, right? They have legato. And so there's a case to be made there for, okay, we, we are slurring it, and we know what a slur means. It means we don't tongue, right? But since that's not true on all the other instruments that don't even have tonguing, what does that mean, right? So we want legato as in the tone never stops. It just continues between the notes. There's no space whatsoever, and they're really part, uh, part and parcel of the same thing. That's what we're looking for, right? So here we go. We're, gonna do, we're just going to do number one a little bit.
I'll finish number one. I'll go a little faster. It's good to start slow though, right? Because we want to make sure we do it right. And um, that's, that's one way to make sure that you're making music and making a good sound and using your air and all the other things that we talk about all the time. faster there to highlight the difference that he's trying to get us to make between legato and staccato, which is the last note of every bar, at least. Right? So there are some other slurs here. We're going to get into the lip slurs because that uh, is where I want to get to uh, quickly. But again, this is a section where there are different types that you can plainly see, and you should do at least one of each type on some interval, right? So maybe you do Maybe at the beginning of each week, you do an Arbenz warm-up and you address your playing in number uh, one and number eight and number 12, and that's it. Uh, or, and, and, then, and then into number 16, 17, 18, right? One of those. Okay. And th th we're getting into like how the Arbenz book can really be... Uh, I'm, I'm going through it pretty meticulously, right? But when you get to the last one of a section, often it will incorporate everything you've worked on. And so once you've worked up to that point, you can use the Arbenz book and just skip to the one that incorporates all of the ones previous. And if there's a problem, you can go back and find it. And if there's not, you've addressed it uh, and you've tried to improve that. Uh, your efficiency, your sound, your intonation, whatever it is, you've done that exercise. So like uh, an example is, I guess, uh, number 15 sort of, is the pinnacle of this little section in some ways. It's, it's still kind of missing a little bit, uh, but I don't think necessarily uh, you, you need to do number 10 instead of number 15. I think number 15 will get it. Um, but you might want to do number 10 just to warm up into it, right? So it's, it's your warm up, you figure it out. Okay, but let's get into lip slurs. So a lot of people have trouble with these. Uh, and page 44, number 22, is my favorite one, and many, many people use it. But if you're having trouble with that, go backwards a, a page or two, and you'll find all the components of number 22. So again, that's the pinnacle one of this little section here. And uh, it incorporates all of them faster and faster and faster. But let's say you're just worried about, you, you know, you, you do number 22, and you get to the 16th notes, and you just can't go any further. Okay, well, how easy can you make those in number 20? Or even better, how easy can you make the triplets that come before it, number 19, right? So uh, I'm gonna do number 18 because I'm not ready for all that. Uh, and I'm just gonna try to make it as smooth and easy as possible. There's a lot of alternate fingerings here, so just pay, pay attention to them. Uh, and I don't know if I'll be able to see all of it, so I might not do the right alter alternate fingerings because I'm weighing it down with my metronome tuner that is now in the way, but I will we'll use a metronome here. I'm not going to go any faster than this. I'm going to let the speed of the rhythm speed me up instead. All right, here we go.
Yeah, so not too bad. I, I just sort of reverse engineered it. I was covering up the whole last line. Hopefully I got it right. Uh, now this one, I, I can't do 19 at all. I'll just have to guess, right? Yeah, that'll be fun. Let's, let's see, it's one, one, three, one, two. Oh, I could just, I could just do it. All right, we're gonna work our way up to 20 and then we'll try one of the uh, 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 pinnacle number 22. you out to do these long slurs even if you're doing them efficiently it's really just it's a long time to play what is essentially a long tone on two notes right so uh, and they're all about the same length because they all do the same fingerings in the same order uh, I guess 18 is a little longer because it comes all the way back down to G uh, but the rest of them tend to end on the D and B and then go up to C to finish but Anyway, yeah, if anybody is on Twitch right now and can see this, please let me know because I had some trouble with it at the beginning of the stream. And uh, so I, that's why I was a little bit late today. And I would love to know if it, if it went on Twitch at all or if Twitch is having uh, some issues, maybe. Uh, it seemed okay to log into, but it just wouldn't let me update the titles. And so I have a feeling that it's not letting me stream right now either. But it will be, a, uh, if you're... If you're seeing this at a later date, you're seeing it on YouTube anyway, so that's uh, where I would suggest people go uh, if if they're interested in this weekly stream, because that seems a little more robust, and it stays there forever, I think, I mean, I guess I haven't checked. All right, let's see if I can get through 20 now. There's a lot of lip slurs, right? But we're going to need it. In the spirit of playing musically, right, this isn't a super musical thing to do, right? It's not very, there's not much to it that way, but I can always go through to the next bar, and uh, I want to at least start with what does it sound like? That's what I screwed up at the beginning, right? I, I didn't think about what eighth notes sound like over the beat, so I just started playing and quarter notes came out. Don't do that. Uh, think about it. It's... Okay, that's what I want it to sound like, and sort of always forward, uh, never faltering until I finally meet the C at the end, and then I can sort of stay there, right? All right, here we go. gets me I mean it, it's just a long time to support and this is again something we all need to work on and we think we can do you know we think we can get through stuff like this pretty easily when we're facile and we, we, we have pretty good lip slur capability but then when you actually go do the exercises in this part of the Arvin's book you find out yeah maybe your catch breaths are not so good maybe you're not so good at getting your embouchure back in the right position when you do a fast breath or maybe it's not even that maybe you just don't play for this long a lot and so it's hard to continue to be facile as you sort of run out of stamina, right? And it is, but this will help you build it. 
So okay, we could go on and do number 21, but number 22 puts them all together, and I know I can do it at this tempo. I'm not sure that it will happen today, but I hope so. And, uh, and then I want to get into the next section a little bit, and then we're going to, then we're going to skip a lot of pages, but I'll, I'll show you uh, little chunks of little things. We're not going to do it today, but uh, depending on what kinds of things you're working on, it will, uh, you might want to stop off in a couple of these sections for your practice, okay? Uh, my dad is on, and he says that Twitch is working at least, so that's good. It just didn't want to update the title for whatever reason, so maybe the uh, Restream and Twitch aren't talking to each other very well these days. We'll find out. All right, so uh, which one are we going to do? Um, oh, gosh, I don't know. Let's do second valve B. I sometimes call this one B natural as opposed to B the wrong way. Um, so, yeah, if, if you ever study with me and I say, okay, let's do B natural, I mean like normal B, right? So let's, let's see if this one will work uh, with the metronome. Plenty of, plenty of lip to spare. These are super short. Now you can do a bunch of them in a, in a row if you want, but I like to do them one at a time and just give myself a little bit of rest and then do the next one because I'm, I'm not working on my stamina here, but you could, right? And this is, like I said, this is the pinnacle of the section. So if you already can do all the ones before it, this is a good way to make, sh to, to maintain that ability and even improve it further. So how do we improve it further? We just make the metronome go faster. And then we see if we can do all of them that way. So I'll often go up to about 140 or 160 by the end of the day, but that's really fast. So we're going to try 130 now, and we'll do, we'll do one more. So you can go as fast as you want. Like I said, 160 is my absolute limit when I'm really doing these every day. 140 is where I'd like to be sure that I can get to no matter what. Uh, that was 130. We don't need to do a bunch more. I'm feeling really, really, really warmed up, like too warmed up. Uh, now there's 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 three, uh, four, four more right here that I want to show you and not do all the way. And that is if you're having trouble with uh, applying this, maybe you can do like a crazy fast lip slur, but when you play pieces, you still feel stiff. Well, number 24 and number 25 are here for you to show you exactly um, how to do that, right? So it's, it's a simplified exercise. And you can always make up exercises, but th the point of today is they're already in the Arbens book, so why don't you just look them up, right? And then you can make up your own that are just like those that are more suited to exactly what you need. But anyway, so number 24, 25, they're incorporating tonguing right alongside the slurs that you know you can do because of the previous section. Uh, so let's do a little bit of each one of those. the idea, right? Number 25 is same exercise but reversed, right? Sometimes people have no trouble tonguing first and then slurring, but they can't slur first and then get into tonguing. It's just a matter of what you need. And again, this would be a great stop off for you if you worked on number 22 for your flexibility or maybe did one slower slur before that. Then you get to 22, you work on your fast sort of lip trill flexibility, right? And then you stop off on 24 or 25 just to check on that. Now, let's say you're having a lot of trouble just getting the, the, the action of a lip trill, right? You just can never go faster than, you know, the quarter notes or the, or the, the usually people get stuck on the triplets, right? And it's, you can tell that you're just, you're doing it with your lip, but you wish you wouldn't. Well, number 26 is here for you because this is going to, if, if you really get this like a grace note, there you go right? There's no way your lip can do it. Or if it can, well, then 
good for you, right? Uh, but this gives you a, sort of a twitchy, one-off um, uh, uh, lip trill speed, right? So I'll do that one for you real quickly. And again, it's like an etude, right? It ends with a nice little, well, I, I change it a little at the end, I do. Because I think it's a little nicer, but uh, it's just two C's in a row. But you can hear it, my, uh, my girlfriend likes to say that sounds like dogs barking. And it does actually, right? It's like a, a yip sound, because it's so fast, changing notes, you hear almost between the notes more than you hear either, either note. And you're playing really short, so it's incorporating the slur and the tongue together which uh, is sort of following through from 24 and 25, but it also can help you do number 22. And then my favorite one, the Clark Terry uh, exercise number 27. It's not really Clark Terry, but it's like some of the things that he played uh, a lot in his career. Uh, and it helps you, it helps you do the, the Clark Terry scale um, in thirds. My dad will know what I'm talking about. But uh, go listen to Clark Terry, and he, he sounds like he's doing these really crazy turns sometimes. And number 27 is how, uh, how you can learn to do the same thing, right? So this is great with a metronome too. Yeah, that's, pr that's pretty good. This will be a fast one. So now you're learning to trust your tongue position and placement and you're holding it. All that stuff is all coming together. And now you have to do it in time, right? And trust it. You don't have time to place each one. So you have to place the whole lick and know that it's all going to come out. And this is where your, your lip slurs really start taking off is uh, stuff like number 27. So here we go. doesn't have that part in there, but I like to just do it. Uh, see if I can triple tongue two octaves. Uh, so again, you, I'm, I'm riffing on the Arbenz book a little bit because I use it a lot. And um, it's not that it gets boring. It's just that you can incorporate other little things into it as you go. Uh, if you want, I'm not going to play it for you right now because I haven't, I'll, I'll just hack through it if I do it. But number 30 is a really good, if, you, if you're really, like you don't want to do page tw uh, uh, number 22 anymore, uh, page 44 in this book. Uh, or maybe you don't want to do that and number 27 and, you know, uh, uh, other ones, right? Then number 28, number 29, 30, uh, in particular 30, these are all little etudes that incorporate all of them all at once. And they're much easier to play musically um, than the exercises themselves, but they make you really think. Uh, I mean, I, I can play a little bit of 30, I guess. May, may as well. get through it. So I got that the alternate fingerings you have to practice. Um, but you can hear it's a nice little etude, right? It's not bad. So uh, that's a good way to get it all kind of working together musically and continue to stay facile. And there's more and more and more um, stuff in this section, but it, it's, it gets away from lip slurs immediately and it doesn't change numbers. And this is a sort of weird section where now we're getting into scales, but there's a scale section. But it's still, remember, the section is legato, not lip slurs, right? So it, at first it had me puzzled for a long time, but then it's like, oh, right, we're doing legato things. And so legato versus staccato might be something that we want to do. And so that's what the next section is all about. And it is scales, so uh, it's, a good where, it's a good place to start your scales in thirds usually. Um, 
and then it gets uh, into some grace notes and other things, right? So there's a lot in this section, and uh, and it gets really hard. Number number 69 at the end. I mean, it's a page of that, right? So okay, then we're into scale studies. Now uh, I'm not going to do. I'm not going to play scale. I've played scales on previous streams before. You don't need to hear me play a bunch of scales. But if you don't know your major scales or your minor scales or your arpeggios, right? These are all in here. Major scales. Great. Got it. Every key? Yep. No problem. With the arpeggios that are diatonic to the scale? Yep. They're right there. Number six. Um, and then it's in every key. You go, get into F. You go into B flat. Right? They're in the order of flats and sharps. So, uh, and they end up really, really fast. So you can just, the best way I've found to do it is try to be consistent with a metronome marking. And then when you get to 30 second notes, you better really know that scale. And you will by then because there's, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, one, two, three, four, five. There's like five different versions of the scale before that. You play every diatonic scale. So that means you're also playing every mode, just diatonically and not abstractly. Right, and so you go through all your scales that way, and uh, and even uh, this book even gives you the the uh, D flat and C sharp are the, the the same, but he wants you to look at it in both keys, and so uh, and then it works its way backwards through the sharps, and then you get your minor minor scales, and the the minor scales are not given the same treatment, but you could easily go back and do them, especially if you've been working on your major scales that way. He just gives you the scale outright, and uh, and he says, okay, well. That's that's the scale, right? Like you uh, now you know what the notes are, so now go off and do do the patterns, right? Uh, and so I I sort of wish that this section was written out the same way, but um, well, there's there's some differences too. It's like they're almost little um, I don't know how to say it. Uh, there's like a modal version of it too, and then sometimes the notes are different in a different order, and I think that's just to prevent you from going up too high, but it it's tricky. So there's some tricks. So just play them outright, and then you can go backwards and do the uh, uh, do do the patterns. There's your chromatic scale, right? A lot of written out chromatic scales. You shouldn't really need to look at it after the first couple, but just kind of figure out what it sounds like. And then chromatic triplets. Now this one you want to do um, because uh, most uh, most pieces uh, around this era have a lot of chromatic triplets, and uh, it's really tricky to get your fingers to do it at first if you're not used to it. So anyway. Then we get to the gruppetto, or grace notes, um, turns, it's that kind of thing, right? And again, this is a section where if you don't know how to do these things, I'll do a little bit. If you don't know how to do these things, it looks really bad on the page. Um, oh, this is number three on my page, 93. Obviously, something I need to work on, right? Uh, they're, they're just they're they're bad keys that have a lot of accidentals. And once you get the pattern, I'm, I haven't ever played this one, I think. Uh, once you get the pattern, then it's like, oh, okay, yeah. And now we do it down a step or down a half step or whatever. But these are all preparatory exercises for the for the gruppetto. The in other words, the the turn, right? And then on page 99, number 24, he writes it out for you so that you know. And it's this little etude. But if you don't know what the turn means, then you can read the written out version right below it. And then you can apply that to the turn. And then you can even make your turns a little later so that they're a little more dramatic and not quite play the same rhythm because now you know what it sounds like. And again, looking at the page, I need to bring off the page the sound and then play the sound musically. If I don't do that, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in a position where I have to calculate things too hard. I have to think about them. And I'm, I'm not going to have time to do that before I'm already late. Uh, if you're looking at it, this is one of my, my big uh, soapboxes to stand on, but if you're looking at the note that you're playing or you're thinking about it like a fingering, then you're not, you're not really playing the line. You're just playing notes after notes. And that's an okay place to start learning something, but don't, by, by no means is that the end product, right? 
we need to play musically. And that means that everything should sound like Frosty the Snowman to you. You need to know it that well so that you can play it that easily. And then you're just singing all day through the trumpet, right? That's where we're supposed to get. All right, so we keep turning the pages and turning the pages. There's lots of these. Again, same method. Just do tomorrow do the next one, tomorrow do the next one, until they get hard, and then practice that one, right? Um, the short appoggiatura, these are just little uh, grace notes, right? And again, he, he tells you, he doesn't really tell you how to do this one, but it gives you a lot of opportunities to work on them. And uh, in fact, this is a section I actually really need to uh, work on. But, um, but for time's sake, I actually I can't do this too much longer. I have homework to do. Um, but there are, there are some very Clark-like things in here. Um, now, he calls this uh, the trill or shake, but it's just a normal trill, right? And it helps you, helps you know basically what note to trill to. So I have a lot of students who want to come in and play the Haydn or the Hummel or something, and they'll say, well, what note do I trill to? And I say, well, didn't you play the Arbenz book? Like you, you always trill to the next note in the key unless it says otherwise, in which case... You should, you know, and this is the section where you, even though it doesn't tell you what to do, it, it gives you only good options. In other words, um, I'll play a little bit of 61. See what I mean? And he starts from above on some of them and from below on other ones because in this era, both are valid, and you need to know which one is appropriate for the piece you're playing. But he gives you both opportunities to, uh, uh, both kinds of opportunities in there, and with with different kinds of trill uh, finishers as well. So okay, and then he writes it out, and da 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 da. Okay, so now where are we getting to next? Well, then we've got studies on the intervals, and this is where uh, we've already done stuff like this, but not nearly this hard, right? And uh, if you don't know your scales. Don't even bother in this section because, uh, oh, well, I mean, unless this is how you want to learn your scales, but boy, would that be punishing, right? So again, stuff that I'm not going to play at you, but uh, it goes on and on. And then you get 16th notes, and this is kind of an interesting, like, okay, yeah, we did a, we've did played a lot of 16th notes up to this point, but, but he puts them in different patterns, and again, those patterns are things you need to know. So this is another section. So if you're keeping track, you know, we probably have, oh, 10 sections of things to do so far that aren't uh, the warm-up stuff, the first studies. And then we get to major and minor chords. Again, if you're a jazz musician or if you just want to sight read better uh, or if you just don't know all of these, again, you'll have played them in the scale section, but this is all of them in all the different permutations of, uh, you know, in, within uh, roughly two octaves. And uh, so, so this is a good place to just practice them so that you recognize them instantly and also you have them under your fingerings uh, or under your fingers so that when you're, now, you're not going to play a, a jazz solo of all arpeggios, probably, but the, you, you need to know what those notes are quickly, right? And, and in some jazz methods, that's the beginning of it. If you do triad pairs, that these are the triads that you are pairing. Now, they don't tell you which ones, but you can easily look that up, and uh, you'll have already practiced it. So, um, and then it gets into diminished seventh, which is another thing. There's dominant seventh I might have skipped. Uh, oops, excuse me. And then now we get into the section I really where it really starts to matter. Uh, that, that's all stuff that you need to know, right? But it doesn't, it's not about your, tr your trumpet playing. So that's, I would practice in that section after my warm-up, but I want to get my, my, tongue, my multiple tongue in going. This is on a lot of people's list of things they want to work on, uh, things they want to improve, in which case you should do it every day. I say this a lot. Uh, you can't do everything every day that you maybe want to improve, but prioritize and do those things every day and then you can do the other things maybe a couple of times a week or once a week or once a month uh, whenever you, you, you know, have the face and the time to do it, right? Maybe you have to wait till a break uh, in, in school or in your career, uh, you know, sort of the gigs kind of dry up like right at the beginning of the summer for some people. And then for other people, that's when, just when it's getting going. So anyway, uh, this is the triple tonguing section on page 150, uh, 155 in this book again. And I like to do single tonguing versus triple tonguing. So I want, I want those to overlap. So I'll use a metronome. Well, it's going to be... Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> That's too fast for now. Da -da 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 -da. Da -da 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 That's about as fast... 100 is about as fast as I'd want a single tongue. So let's try this. We're get, I'm just going to start on number one. This is, again, this is one where if, if, 
If number one's easy for you, then great. Perfect it, move on tomorrow to number two. Okay, if that's easy, great. Perfect it, move on to number three. Um, and eventually you'll find one that's really difficult for you that you want to work on every day. And it'll only take you 30 seconds or whatever. And then maybe another 20 seconds to work it out and then another 30 seconds to play it. And now you've improved your triple tonguing and you move on, right? Just little, little bits and pieces of things. Oops, sorry. So that was single tongue. Now we're going to triple tongue. there's to it. Now I can't do this with every one of them and I, I also don't want to only be able to triple tongue this slowly. I'm going to push that as well but these are good ones to get that overlap going and then as I do ones later well let's do one one that's later and again you could you could split these into smaller sections so you do some easy single note like that triple tonguing and then maybe you go on to ones that are changing notes uh, 16 or 15 I guess 15 is the first one that makes you change notes mid triple tongue and uh, and then they start to do it like every every part of the trip a triple tongue uh, cycle is a different note but uh, let's pick one that we feel like we can do I'll just do well 17 is a challenge for me because downward TTK is uh, is harder for me than than to pull out the low note uh, for the first one so I'll do this one and we could do it at the same tempo because it's a different pattern but uh, I'm doing this to, to speed up my triple tongue, right? And you could do the overlap and then speed it up or whatever you want to do. But the 120 is too fast for me to single tongue for sure. I can't do it yet. But I can do that, I think. We'll see. Keep forgetting to turn the mic. I'm sorry, um, but that's that's a good that's that's pushing it. And if I could do that every day, then I can push it a little further the next day, right? So it gets it gets intense in this section, but it as it should. And then we've got the double tonguing section as well, right? And this one starts on 175, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, there it is. Um, and uh, you should do both every day, I think. Uh, we'll we'll skip around on this one and do uh, we'll get to the ones that change all the time. Yeah. I'll do 87, how about that? And since it's double tongue, we can go even faster. I can't quite single tongue that fast. Let's go 140 and do an overlap. Now, and this time, just for economy, I'm gonna do single tongue, double tongue, single tongue, double tongue, like that, right? Let's see if I can. It's gonna be rough on my single tongue. This is 140 on number 87, page 177. I did two in a row there once, and so then I did two of the, of the other one in a row. But uh, hopefully you couldn't tell the difference too much, right? So again, just work on one, and then the next day work on the next one, and the next day work on the next one. And uh, this is all part of your, all part of your warm up, right? We've been doing it for now a minute and almost, uh, sorry, a minute, an hour and a half. But I've been talking a lot through it and giving more examples than you need. This would only probably take about half an hour if you just did them straight through. And I say that a lot. Uh, if you're using these as warm-ups, 
watch the video, understand all the components, right? Look through your Arvin's book, take, take an hour or two to do that one time, and then write down what you're going to do. Write down your plan, right? And then you can write down the sections and which page you did, and you can keep track of that, and that's your trumpet journal, right? It's a great way to do it. All right, now we're into the, the, the most important part, which is where we play melodies melodically, musically, right? And uh, the art of phrasing is here for a reason, right? Ooh, it says professor of the Imperial Conservatory of Music. I've never heard the Paris Conservatory called that before. I'm sure that everybody else knows that already, but uh, so you can just pick a new one. There's, a, there's 150 of these, so that's half a year of, you know, a, a new one every day. So you can sight read, you can try to do so musically and with good tone, intonation, and time, right? And, uh, and, and it'll help you, if you know all of the sounds because you've been doing this through the rest of the Arvin's book, then this part's a piece of cake, right? So again, this is why this is the only book you'll ever need, so to speak. I'm gonna do uh, one that I can't say the name of, uh, La Cenerentola by Rossini. This is on page 208, number 61. So, not too bad. I probably went a little slow. Uh, yeah, my dad says Jen Murata is uh, in, the, in the process of recording these, and that's absolutely true. Uh, and they're great. Uh, she, she puts them out on, um, well, she's collecting them all, and I'm sure going to release them with the next edition of the Arbenz book. They did all the characteristic studies already, and, um, and really the whole book. Uh, but So you can go check that out. It's, it's really the best part of the new edition. Uh, the only part that's bad is the page numbers, uh, and, and even that is like, well, if we all end up using that book, then we'll change our mind about the page numbers, and we'll just use the new ones, right? But uh, anyway, yeah, she releases them on her Instagram, um, which is just something like Jen Murata Trumpet, um, and they're great. It's like a new one every week or so, and they're just really beautiful and musical, and uh, as, they, as they should be, because uh, she had a career in the Marine Band for a while, and um, and, you know, played cornet. She doesn't, actually, I don't know if she plays cornet on all of them. The one I'm thinking of, I think she does, but anyway, um, so she just, she, she knows exactly what she's doing on this stuff, and, um, and it's just a huge resource uh, for us. So anyway, so now we've played musically. We've played all of our technique. We could have done a bunch of scales and arpeggios and stuff, and now let's say we want to really, we, we want a trial. We want to try, try something that's really hard. Now, these get harder as they go, by the way, but, uh, you know, the next thing you have is, well, you get, you get some almost solos, right? Like, they, they are solos, but, and some of them even have accompaniments, actually. Bluebells and Yankee Doodle have, uh, and God Save the Queen, they have accompaniments. But uh, then you get to the duets. Again, another thing that you should do every day. Now, I can't play a duet by myself here, so I'm going to skip it, but... That would, be, that would be a good thing to be like, oh yeah, I practice at the same time as uh, Jared over there, so maybe I'll just go uh, see if he wants to play a duet, right? So I'm going to skip that. And then finally, um, well, not quite finally, but you have the characteristic studies, right? Which we've done some of as well. But look how they, if, you look, if you're looking with me, right? Look how they look just like everything we've done already, right? We've worked on all of this. We've worked on... Legato versus staccato. We've worked on grace notes. We've worked on 
uh, the scale patterns that we need. We've worked on uh, chromatic scales. We've worked on arpeggios, right? That's all that these things are. Um, the one that I need to work on, and I will, I will not play it very well for you, is number 11. Um, and that's because, uh, I, th so this is like the gruppetto and the interval studies combined with the grace note studies, and that's the part that gets me, right? So it's, the, uh, it's probably because I go too fast too, but it's this, I'll play a little bit of it and you'll see why I mean. Uh, and I just need to work out the coordination of it um, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll do it a little bit for you here. It just doesn't feel right to me, and I can't really look at it. I just need to play it, but that's what I mean. I need to go back to the grace notes section, work this, work out just being comfortable with this particular F sharp G grace note. And it's not very difficult to do, but just whatever it is about this passage really throws me for a loop. So I need to practice either this passage a lot or go back in t into the Arbenz book and, and search it out. But the rest of it is not so bad, so I'll play some of it. So we've played this before, but uh, you can see why that section, I just went through it without stopping no matter what. And, you know, I ended up on the wrong fingers and did a bunch of stuff. But everything else is working for me because I practiced that stuff before. So, of course, no wonder. Uh, if I haven't practiced it, it's not going to go well. And then we even get a little in the end of this one. This is why this is a good one. We even get a little in the end of some lip slur, uh, lip trill action, right? Uh, I'll play a little bit of that. I don't know if I've ever played this part, actually. We get a turn, a full actual turn. Um... But anyway, here we go. Right, that's pretty cool. So we get a lot of different things in these. Sometimes they're really one trick ponies where you just do the same thing the whole way through, uh, like number five or one of those. Uh, but, but a lot of them are like these full blown etudes. And of course, these precede the solos. And the solos need basically everything, right? Um, you can find solos in A in here. And unfortunately, they're generally just published in, as A cornet versions with the piano part. Um, I'll try to do this one. This is a good one. Same kind of thing that we just did. What is it? Uh, Fantasy Brilliant. I, I, normally, I do the Carnival of Venice because that's what everybody wants to hear. But I haven't done this one in a while. And um, we're working on the, uh, the other little, uh, the end of the art of phrasing, we've already done some theme and variation, so we should be familiar with that format by now. And this is just, now these are accompanied, these have band arrangements, these are full-blown pieces. And again, how long would it really take you to get to this 300th page, right? 309 in this case. Uh, if I'm working on one thing a day, there's usually four or five things, uh, sometimes only one or two, so let's call it, there's three things on a page per day, right? And I start with the first one, and then I skip a few and I do another one, and I skip a few and I do another one, and I'm, let's say I'm doing 10 of those per day, right? That's 10, 10 pages and one of the things on each page, right? Okay, so let's just math it out. If I, if I perfect it every day and I move on to the next one and I can just do it right away, which that would be the fastest version, but it's sort of methodical, right? then I'm, it's going to take me three days to get off the first 10 pages, right? And there's 300 pages in the Arbenz book, so uh, it, it'll take me 
300 days, right? In other words, uh, it'll, it, if I do 10 pages a day, it'll take, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I uh, divided by 10, right? It's 30 days, but then it's going to take me tw three times uh, that. So that's only 90 days, right? And then, okay, so save for the days that I can't do the thing, right? And then I have to do it multiple days. And so, of course, I'm going to get stuck. But if I do, again, if I do 10 pages a day, I think I'm doing this right. 10 pages a day, it'll take me 30 days to get through the whole Arvin's book, except then I'm only, I'm doing one of three things on each page each day. So that'll take me three extra days. So, th you know, you see what I mean? 300 divided by 30 times three is how, how long. Um, and even if it did take 300 days, that means you went from not being able to play the trumpet at all to being able to play Fantasy Brilliant in a year. That would be incredible. So, uh, of course, it takes longer than that, but that's because we rush it. That's because we try to do things that we shouldn't, we really have no business doing. And it's okay to do that, right? It just takes longer, and there's no reason for us to do it the most efficient way. But if you're looking for a way, this is a good one. So, I'll play a little bit of Fantasy Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to skip the beginning. I'm just going to play. I want to get into it, right? Uh it's been a while since I've played this. I'm sight reading it a little bit, so so give me a little slack. But I'll I'll play little bits and pieces of the theme and then the variations. using my uh, arpeggio skills to just try to identify them before I, before I, if I look at the note I'm playing, I'm already not going to see the next arpeggio. And I almost did it there, but uh, I bailed myself out. We'll see how well that keeps working. I don't know. My dad corrected me, but I already figured it out. Uh, the, the stream has a 26 second delay, so. Um, all right, last variation. I hope I can make it. We'll see how far I can get. I don't know if I can. A lot of triple tonguing. starting to lose it. Uh, tired after an hour and 40 minutes, right? Yeah, of course I am. But this is what I mean is, okay, if I do this every day, I don't talk too much. I do rest a little bit longer. Uh, I figure out those periods of rest where I can do three or four things in a row and then go away for 10 minutes and then come back, right? Then I'm going to be fresh for this. And, uh, and I also could just take a big break and I've already done my routine. This is not part of my routine. I'm just practicing now, but I'm practicing music. I'm practicing utilizing all those skills. And so that's why this is such a great book uh, that we all use so much. Uh, but most people don't use it, I think, enough. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I invent stuff every day to help me play the trumpet better. And I go, oh, you know, I need, I need to, 
you know, whatever it is. I just come up with an exercise to help me clean something up or play softer or play louder or play higher. Um, the only thing we didn't address really is high range in the entire book. And I do that in literally every other warm up. So that's the only thing we didn't address. And uh, I, I don't think that there's a necessarily a reason for that, except uh, that they, the, the, they, they were playing different instruments back then. And if you're playing your scales uh, the same way all the way up and down, well, that's still true today, but I mean, um, the, the instruments kind of, they were smaller bore, and so the high range was a little, I think a little more accessible if you just continued to play the same way and tongue well. Uh, then those notes would come out a little bit better. And now I think I think it's still worth dealing with. Um, but if you if your lip slurs are really good and you're playing your scales two octaves, well then you're going to play high Fs every day. You're going to play high F sharp probably, or at least low F sharp, right? So your range is kind of in there. Um, but I, I prefer to address it the way that we normally do with lip trills at the top of the staff. And that's not really something that we deal with in here in that register. There is number 23, which... Uh, does I'll, I'll do number 23 i can sort of remember it i'm not going to turn to it but uh it, it it's just slower version of that top of the staff lip trill right it goes like this right like that all the way up to high c that's the only thing that kind of approaches that register um, other than scales. So, uh, and that, I mean, it's just part of the part, part and parcel of the day. Um, you didn't really play much above high D unless you were a soloist. And then you, you could just, you would add things like high Fs to the end of the solos, but not in 1860. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, that's going to be it for me today. Uh, that's plenty. And I'm, I'm worn out from all that, uh, straight seven playing on that Besson. So, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something useful about the Arbenz book. Uh, I hope if you're one of my students that you will develop your own sort of routine using the Arbenz book. Uh, the only downside of the Arbenz book routine is that you have to carry it around all the time. And, uh, but since there's free PDF versions of it, you don't even necessarily have to do that. If you just keep a log of what page, what pages you're using right now and kind of you know, what's on them and wh where you're at, you, you know, you can keep a very easy log of how fast on what numbers you're doing and then go to the next one and then go to the next one and just log that. And uh, pretty soon you're doing pretty incredible things. So I wish I had done this sooner, but uh, uh, I, I don't know why I didn't. I just, I, I always, everybody always goes to the parts that they already know in the Arbenz book and the solos in the back. And then they might use some of the other things sometimes. But uh, I've really enjoyed sort of getting into the, back into the Arbenz book, uh, both with my students and in my own practice. So anyway, like I said, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll catch you next time. All right. Thanks for coming.